So with the blind uh, coming out soon, um, Zach, what I've noticed is is with independent films, uh, especially, I guess, faith films, it's, it's really hard to get that momentum like the big studios have because they have these big contracts, all that stuff, and we're just kind of building this thing from scratch. Is that is that a good way to look at it? Yeah, and I think just underscores the importance of getting out now. Buying tickets today, they're for sale right now as we're sitting here talking. Uh, the movie comes out September 28th, but... And I really want to encourage you guys to get out and purchase your tickets today at theblindmovie.com. And I think we're viewing this movie from our perspective as a mission effort. I mean, this is the gospel going out to impact yeah. people's lives because it impacted our lives. So check it out, theblindmovie.com. Uh, buy your tickets today. I am unashamed. What about you? Does it seem like to you that every time you turn around, you're sitting here? The- <laughs> or I'm preparing to sit here? Yes, it does. That's that's what happens with podcasts. It's, it's either prepping or you're here. Um, so we've said this before. We do, we record podcasts. We typically record two on the same day. So even though last podcast we brought up that it was Jason's birthday, it's still Jason's birthday. Isn't because, that crazy? <laughs> it's three or four days. Three or four later. days have gone by, and yet we're still here celebrating that Jace is 54. And the only reason he knows that is his daughter wrote it in his card. Yeah, I got my cards this morning in my because I wasn't sure how old I was, which is okay. And uh, my daughter was like, happy 54th. And I was like, yes. Well, if you're 54 and I'm your father. <laughs> you're old. I'm, I'm, I'm. Uh, Jace, he is your father. I'm looking on my left and right, and everything I see is death. <laughs> uh, I know what you're you going to do, be 60, and I'm still here. I'm Jace, like, yeah. I mean, Dad, I'm 58. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be 60 here, you know, in about a year and a half. So just I'm so. already ahead of the curve, in my opinion. Well, you I'm are. thankful, Phil. It's a good birthday that you're still here. So, so I remember when baiting the trot line when Sire. Run yeah. up on the bank. What well, you want to call him, Miss Gager? How has already had that baby? I said, name him after you. Yeah. Kept baiting my line. I yeah. think he was actually, that was code. And for, he did. I think that was code for, come on, let's go to the hospital and see Jace. <laughs> but you but missed Apparently, it. he missed that code. So, I didn't see but one of y'all being birthed, but I saluted the females of the world. I said to go through that misery when I yeah. watched Jep being born. Well, that's good, Phil. That was you had a I you had watch some clarity. Born. Yeah, yeah. Well, your mama's yeah, y'all were teenagers when I was. I, it's a wonder I'm still alive. So, um, Jason, you so you're going to see Barbie? I understand on your birthday. Is that is that what I heard? I'm not sure what that <laughs> means. So I guess. <laughs> The reason I brought that up is because our crack staff here, our our producer of our podcast, I found out today that she was dragged to Barbie by other people on our staff that do our podcast. And I was like, so what what has happened? If you're we, gonna have to define, have we lost all control? define Barbie uh or am I gonna have to You have to look at you look it up. <laughs> And see, I'm not sure what that means. It, it's a it's a cultural phenomenon. It's a big movie. It's a blockbuster. Oh, it's a movie. It's a called movie. Barbie. It's called Barbie. I, it, let me just it's tell a you right live now. Live version of the Barbie doll, but it's an actual person. Oh, apparently. I was fixed to say, no matter what it is, I don't go to see movies named Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> just as a general rule. Just uh, I mean, whether it's well, we've whether whether it's the, the, uh, we've been talking with Maddie. Maddie's, you know, she's newly married. You know, she's, we love her. She's Mark. And so we're trying to give her some marital advice. And so the first thing I say is, please don't tell me that you dragged your husband. You just went with some other girlfriends or whatever. And she said, no, I, I, he went with me. And I was like, oh, Maddie, we, we've got a lot of work to do. See, to we, tell you how <laughs> far I am away from this conversation, when you first said that, I thought, is it a movie about barbed wire fences? <laughs> uh I, or a shrimp on the Barbie? What I, about that? I, was it Dumb and Dumber? familiar? No, I thought Bob Our Fences. That's where I went. I thought it was maybe some, you know, we were having some military deal, and it was about Bob Our Fences. Survival, yeah. the Barbie movie. I like uh, it. I like where well, you're going with that. That's where I was going. So I was, you know, this this passage that, that we're going to talk about today, there's not a whole lot of scholars, there's not... 
there's not much information. People don't want to talk about the Pharisees. And so I'm studying, I'm looking. I didn't find a whole lot, but I'm thinking about the contrast between the Pharisees and Jesus. And so, uh, you know, we have our two grandkids at our house. And so Missy summons me to make a grocery run. We had to have bananas and different things, different kids things. You know, my granddaughter, she's, she's obsessed with bananas and had to get water to make bottles. You know, we're, we're back in this, the baby maintenance here, which is a full-time job when there's too little. Which was kind of good in a way because y'all had taken care of a baby before you had grandkids, so you kind of got a little back in. Oh, I know. Yeah, it, it that seems, probably helped you a little bit. Now, no matter what I do, I look around, and there there's little toddlers <laughs> just, <"Rah!" laughs> and so you're having to manage this, you know, which, which was interesting because uh, when uh, Reed got, got home last night, so <laughs> she threw a little fit, uh, Maris. Well, Missy and I never moved because I had seen the little drama. She's got a little drama. Oh, I say fit. It's, it's not a fit. It's just it's for a, what, it's a play. It's well, she, yeah, for whatever the reason. In a play. It's a walk to the middle of the floor, fall and, out, and fall out in a dramatic way, and and start to cry. But then, which the first time it happened. I started to get up until she stopped crying and looked up to see if we were looking. <laughs> and then I sat back down because I thought, oh, no, if <laughs> this play won't work. So, But I noticed Reed was looking at us, and I'm like, it's okay. I got nothing here. <laughs> and Just after a while, out. since he was there, she continued, you yeah. know, and finally he, I thought, yeah, these yeah. parents <laughs> – he he gave in. <laughs> she wore him down in a short period of I time. I said yesterday, Ray, when that happened, I found that song, Happy, Happy. <laughs> I said, and that worked just as well as the comforting. We're not playing that game. But anyway, so I go to the grocery store, and this is right after my study on what are we going to do about the Pharisees and Jesus. How, you know, how, what, what are we going to talk about on this? So I go to the grocery store. You know, I'm happy because I love grocery stores. I'm buying food. Which I'm, let me, before, I'm sorry to interrupt your story. Jay, Dad, you know what's amazing? You raised four sons. You don't, you've never gone to the grocery store probably two times in your whole life. That's true. But you raised four sons that love to go. To, and every yeah. one of your sons, we are the grocery shoppers in our family, me included. And well, I love it. Well, I had, I had. I, I said it's because we didn't have a lot to eat. To we this were, day, I've never been. I haven't been in a grocery store in over you know a decade or two. Well, you're missing out. Because yeah, look, it's fantastic. Mine, the store is. Full I lay awake of the at night food. saying, "Oh, what am I missing out there?" Yeah. I had an well, event that happened in my life. There was no, there was no childhood memory. It. I went to the Ukraine mission trip, early '90s, and we we gave away all our food because you know the. They were worse off than you were. The wall had just come down, and we were humanitarian slash Jesus mission. Yep. I gave away my food. Actually, y'all converted quite a few. Oh, I think. think. Hundreds, yeah, came to the Lord, which is why that's this war that's going on was, you know, I'm, I keep up with this war. I have a lot of friends yeah. and uh, a lot of people that I'll see in heaven from, from that venture. But when I went to the Ukraine grocery store after five days of not eating— I mean, it got it, it, it got real, <laughs> and they had four choices in the whole grocery. It was just barren. Yeah, and none of the four, I thought I would rather die than try to eat that. <laughs> and so, uh, which shows you I wasn't as hungry as I thought I was. <laughs> but when we went, I've told this story before. But when we went back, you know, home and stopped in Moscow on the way back home, it's been five days since I've eaten any real real food and i visited the world's largest mcdonald's which was in moscow and uh, we we made things right but when i got back to america the first time i walked into a grocery store it was the music started playing there was no music on but in my head everything was brighter everything looked fresher the choices were overwhelming and i made a vow in that moment I will live here the rest of my life. (laughs) 
So when I walk into a grocery, I'm having a bad you know, day. You're saying you think it's bad here until you go visit <laughs> hey, everybody else. I have never, for the for the rest of my life since that moment, taken for granted a grocery store or a McDonald's. By the way, you know you're like, oh McDonald's is fast food. Let me tell you, when you hadn't eaten in so, five days, it tastes like a ribeye steak. <laughs> it's, it's fast, it, all right. <laughs> oh, I. <laughs> How fast can you eat it? Yeah, i look. I spent a thousand dollars just to get to the front of the line that day in Moscow because I I was like I'm not a thousand rubles or a thousand dollars. No, I spent a thousand Ukrainian dollars, okay. which they had to go. That was about ten. It was seven hundred and fifty to one. So I'm carrying around a box. <laughs> um, it, it was like one of them boom boxes. That's I had a box. Well, if we keep coming, bigger than a if boom, we box. keep operating like we've been operating the last four, five, six years. Uh, you might see those things again where you're back. in Moscow. That's exactly right. So hang on, I haven't even told my story. Yet. You get back to your story. You're so, at the grocery. So I, I go to the, the grocery store. store. I'm buying. You know, I'm happy because I love grocery stores. So when I get to the checkout, uh, there was a young, like, teenage girl. who There was two long lines. And so I, it had the recipe for me being, oh, but remember, I'm in a grocery store. You're happy. I'm happy. And she's like, do you want me to help you? And I was like, great. It just gets better and better. And so when she went to the, uh, you know, to check me out, and I'm going through the line, I noticed that people were, they had ice cream cones. And I was like, What's up with the ice cream cones? Because I was, it's hot, you know, it's the hottest summer we've ever had. And she said, well, they're free, you know, to the customers. She's like the only one in the world. And I was like, only one in the world? And she said, well, I'm not sure, but it's the only one I've ever heard of. <laughs> it's and, uh, the only one like, I work at that has it phrased. Yeah. And I was like, so let me get this right. Because I, I love grocery stores. And I started, you know, telling her why. And I was like, and now I have found a grocery store that gives you free ice cream cones. Right. And so you say, what does this got to do about you studying and preparing? Because then she said something really that goes in line with what we're going to talk about. And she said, do you know what I can't figure out? She said, people will come up here and fix an ice cream cone and leave. I said, no way. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, what is the policy on that? Because I figure, you know, it's like some of these gas stations. Yeah, they give you the stink eye if you don't buy it. No, something. no, I, that one, you know how much I travel. I've noticed a lot of gas stations will say, use of bathroom only with purchase. Because for a while, the reason I noticed that, I you thought. You need to take a leak. <laughs> you can only use this bathroom if you pay for something. Right. And so I thought, Pharisee. <laughs> <laughs> so when I asked her the policy, because I had that all fresh on my mind, yeah. and she said, no, the owner is fine with that. They just want people in our store. And I said, grace. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for grace. And she looked at me kind of bewildered. I said, you just gave me the cold open for my podcast tomorrow. <laughs> and she said, you have a podcast? I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, can I use this story? I said, because we're talking about Pharisees. They were in it. It really, because I didn't know if she's a believer or not, but we talked about grace a free gift with no strings attached versus you have to pay for, you have to bring something to the table to participate in this wonderful ice cream cone. I thought it was a perfect So, segment. So, Jason, I have a Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. So right. the story you were in yesterday, I'm very familiar with it, Max Fresh Market. And you know why I love them, Dad? Because they're all about fresh. And the man that owns Max, whose name, whose nickname is Mac, he, you, I bet you both don't. know I don't this. know. It's, when you started talking, I was not, I wasn't even aware of what the name of the store was. <laughs> so Mac bought. He's a great Christian guy, by the way, Jace. To further your story, so he's a believer. He bought the one millionth duck call made. That one year we made a million duck calls. And I had, they brought me up to sign it. Brought well, you up to you sign know it. That? I know things, Jason. Okay. This is back when I worked for the company. Mac came in, bought that duck call for, I think it was, I want to say $25,000. What? He did. But we I wonder where my check was. No, no, no. <laughs> we we got to hear the rest of the story. This is Paul Harvey. I didn't get anything no, out of it. No, because he don't, Duck Commander donated. The duck call price to Camp Chioka. So the twenty five thousand. That's why you didn't get anything. Phil was for the kid. It was for the well, kid. Well, that's good to practice generosity. 
<laughs> just but like, like the, just let me, you let me know though. Just like the ice cream. So isn't that funny? The guy that is giving away ice cream. I should have known. Myth.com. I should have known. Anybody giving free ice cream cones <laughs> at a grocery store with no strings attached had done something good, something amazing, and was and was in our world. I didn't know that. No, I know it. And I just happened to be working there, and I knew that he's the one that bought it. We had auctioned it, and he 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 auctioned the most money. He he bid the most money for the duck call. Well, and, I'll be. And we gave it to charity, which is really I didn't awesome. know that. All right, go. Are we going to get into the Bible? Here? We are going to get into the Bible, and uh, we come back from our break. We Since we're filming the same day as the last podcast, we have our guest back, uh, which who was super last time, Kyle Thompson. So yes. we come back from the break. Uh, Kyle's going to join us to talk about uh, the rest of Luke 11. So I don't know. Do you like to, do you like to sleep? Cold or sleep hot? <laughs> oh, you know that. I go with cold. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're all like cold, right? And it even even in the winter time, you know, you don't want to. You like but it's good to have a blanket, but at the same time, you don't want to sleep too hot, right? You get hot at night, you can't sleep. A lot of that has to do with your sheets. And we have one of our sponsors, which has been a sponsor of our podcast for a long time, and, and Lisa and I have used their product for longer than that. They're called Bowl and Branch. It's a super high quality sheet. And that's one of the things I love about it is the sheets are cool. And so you're not sweating on them at night because that's a big part of it. And a lot of it is what they make them out of. They don't use any harsh chemicals, all these synthetic pesticides that other people are using. Um, Great sheets, 100% organic uh, cotton threads, the best on earth. They're loved by millions. Uh, 10,000 rave reviews are out there. They also have a 30-night risk-free guarantee with free shipping and return, so you can try them. you got nothing to lose to try them. Uh, They fit deep onto the mattress, which I love. That means they don't come off at night as well. So check them out. Sleep better at night with bowl and branch sheets. Get 15% off your first order when you use the promo code Robertson at bowlandbranch.com. That's B-O-L-L-A-N-D, branch, bowlandbranch.com. Use the promo code Robertson. Exclusions apply. See their sites for details. So welcome back. Um, welcome back, Kyle. It's good to have you back on the podcast. Glad to be back. Yeah, we're excited to have you here. Dad, you were about to say I was say just something. discussing uh, that when people, when you bear fruit, love, joy, peace, you come to Jesus. You're you're cleansed of your sins. You you repent and you believe Jesus died for you, was buried and raised from the dead. You're baptized. Now what? You look around. Well, when you begin to bear fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, you you look at that and you say, You're not doing it to be saved. You've already put your faith in Jesus. You're doing it because you are saved. Yeah. So you don't have to catch everything and make it say, well, I got to make sure I got to move from, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. I better not miss one. You just need to live like that. And your sins are been taken away. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're cleansed. I mean, really, I think you, that's, you have that. representation in heaven. Jesus appealing when you make a mistake. He says, I blew that one, Lord. Well, give it to Jesus. He, keep, get up. Let's go. Let's keep going. But it's not like if I do this, 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 this today, I'll be saved. You're, 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 you're missing the point. Well, because it's natural, right? You're not under law. Jesus said in John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you're in me, you bear fruit because you're in me. That's what I do. They confuse but, fruit bearing with with what, what Lucato said. Legalism is the search for innocence, not forgiveness. Yeah. They forget how they're saved. Systematic process of defending self, explaining self, exalting self and justifying self. The obsession with legalism, self not God, legalism has no pity on people. Legalism makes my opinion your burden, makes my opinion your boundary, and makes my opinion your obligation. Well, such a great quote. You just missed the point. Yeah. Well, the anyway, sequence, the sequence matters. I mean, the gospel says grace leads to obedience. The legalism says obedience leads to grace, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that's in, in the, the old Jewish system in their defense, they were given the law, 
But even there, if you go back, it was after God had delivered them. Yeah. They Grace just didn't make the connection. Grace is far greater than law, far, far greater. The reason Jesus, he's the one who wrote it. Well, he get, right. dies to get you out from under it. You, you would think, boy, what a way for all this to have worked out for the better for the human race. Well, in the last podcast, we spent the whole time in the Old Testament, right? We were mostly in Psalms. We talked about Job. Grace was there then. I mean, it's not like because there was an old system of law that grace wasn't present. I mean, the whole idea behind Abraham is that there was faith in grace. So it it was a big mistake in the first century. Pharisees and the the ones, they they rose up to bring it back worse than grace. I mean, uh, worse than it is in reality. Right. Way worse. And so we're in Luke 12, 37. This is the new text that we're about to go into 11, it. So, 11. I mean, I'm sorry. I keep trying to do Luke 12. Luke 11, 37. And we're talking about these Pharisees, and Jason, we were talking about it before we came on the air, that uh, there's not a lot written about this. And uh, we are all doing some deep dive into this it's really not. background it, it, about it was Pharisees. Surprising. I always, I always listen to Keller and other commentaries, but they just, they just skipped over it. And, uh, you know, in Keller's defense, I think, you know, he was pastoring a church in New York for years, and it's more, he's dealing with more of the skeptics rather than, you know, religious people who are legalist or... Uh, and I think because of our background, we see it more clearly. I certainly have met what I would consider to be, and again, I'm not judging other people's motives and hearts, but I've met some people that fit into this Pharisee mindset in church settings where it was very much about rules on top of rules. Right. And uh, so I think we see it more clearly, which is why I, I totally related to these guys in the text, because I've seen it before. Well, it's kind of like what you're saying. So when you have Keller, who's dealing with skeptics, and after every sermon, he's staying there to deal with skeptics and their questions. And that's where the book Reason for God comes from, was from a lot of those conversations. But in the South, or like in Oklahoma, where every time you trip and fall, you will land on a church, no matter where you are. Like, that's just kind of how, how you know, ubiquitous churches are there. It's almost kind of sad. Well, but but to a degree, it's like you get this kind of colloquial version of Christianity. And, you know, I've kind of worked through this idea, like, there's, there's country music theology to where it's like, you know, you can talk about God and prayer and, you know, how you're, you know, going to see him while you're out there on your John boat. And like, it's that type of attitude, but there's no discussion of Jesus. There's no discussion of fruit, Phil. There's no discussion of, of the gospel. It's just like, well, I'm born in the South and, and you know, my grandmama went to church. And so like, you know, I'm, you I'm a Christian. Church. It's yeah. like, but, but God doesn't have grandbabies, right? You know, it's like, you know, God has his children and that that's it. And so, but again, that's, that's where the Pharisaical, Pharisaical stuff and the Sadducees and like that type of an attitude comes from a overchurched population that is depending on church attendance and not the gospel. But actually that fits perfectly into before we get into the text because the Pharisee sect began in the era of 600 to 500 BC and it actually started out a great thing because it started out with the concept y'all were talking about this idea of skeptics it started out in the context of Babylonian captivity and the inspiration for the Pharisees was Daniel one of the heroes of the Bible who wouldn't bow the knee you know, to the idolatry of the Babylonians, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were willing to go in a fiery furnace rather than not do what God wanted to do. So that's what spawned the Pharisee sect. The problem was they started out trying to remove themselves from the world's culture and idolatry to be separate and to do what God wanted to do, good thing. And they turned that into an internal separation of once everybody was in Israel, then they began to separate out who was really spiritual, who really wasn't, who was unclean, who was clean. And so it just got, the more rules they added, the harder it was. And so they took what God meant to be a blessing and turned it into a burden. And again, without throwing rocks at them, I get it. When you go through 600 years of trying to be better, at some point it became about them. And dad read that Max Cato quote, it became about self. Yeah, but the apostle Paul... When he started out the book of Romans, called to be an apostle, he's talking about himself, set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son. And he says, as amazing as it sounds, we're sitting here and the power we're sitting around 
We're not ashamed of the gospel because it, the gospel, the death of Jesus, his burial, is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentiles. We're all together on this. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So our mantra, very saying, uh, unashamed of the gospel, you say, hmm, we're trying to get everyone to see this thing is a lot easier than they're making it out to be. Every little jot and tittle, right. that's the law. You'll never be, you'll never say, man, when, when is one of these sins going to not plague me anymore? Well, when you know you're in a situation where you live by faith, not by the law. Nothing is perfect by the law. Nothing was made perfect. Right. No one ever kept it except the one who wrote it and then says, I'm going to get you out from under it. Here's another system, a lot better. Yeah. Just faith. So I feel like we should get into the text, but I do want to say, you know, when 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 this started and you look at the Pharisee opposition, you know, before I read this, and the Sadducees that come up commonly, you know, the Sadducees didn't like the Pharisees because the Pharisees had all these what they call oral laws or amendments to all the laws. And this is one of them that's fixed to come up because, you know, first thing I did when I read this is I go back and look, oh, well, there's some kind of laws about washing your hands or, you know, and I didn't find any. So I realized, oh, this was part of their, their amendment to the law. So they could and, control and, you know. Yeah, and I read impact. it. I went and read it. And, and, you know, it's, and look, they're still observing it to this day. So it was not a, because it's about washing your hands, but it was, it's not a hygiene thing. It, you know, it's hard for us to wrap our head around this, and I think the reason there's not a lot of information on this, because as soon as you read it's it. It's a doctrinal position. Yeah, as soon as you read it, you're like, oh, well, Jesus, he wasn't into washing his hands. Because we all know now, you know, 2,000 years later, that it's a good idea to wash your hands, and I'm pretty sure Jesus would go along with that. Since you created but, germs, I think you knew. Yeah. Hang on, Jesus, let's <laughs> take a break. So we've been talking a lot on recent podcasts about worry, but also about medical stuff. We talked about Mia and you know all the surgeries that she's had and different things like that. And we understand, you know, our audience understands when a, a medical need comes up. Um, we try, we're trusting in God. We're trying not to worry about how we're going to get this paid for. Right. And yet we all have that because we do, you know, we have these realities. So we've got a new sponsor and they're called Samaritan Ministries. Uh, it's a community of Christians and basically how it's set up is you help pay each other's medical bills. It's not insurance. Uh, it's assurance. They call it, uh, being a part of a healthcare sharing community, um, where not only you help financially, but you can also help spiritually. And so uh, you can join any time. Uh, your medical bills are sent to Samaritan Ministries. They notify fellow members. Uh, they're going to send the, the money directly to you uh, for your shareable bills. Also, they're going to pray for you, which is incredible. Um, so you're going to get comfort. You're going to get encouragement from these guys, which is a great blessing. And what I really love is that when in a medical emergency comes up, you don't have to give a second thought to where the hospital's in the network the ER doctor, is he covered? Uh, Samaritan Ministries has no network restrictions, so you have total freedom to choose whatever doctor, hospital, or treatments are best for you and your family. You also get access to exclusive health resources to keep medical costs low and access to medical professionals. You can do that by phone or by email uh, to get the medical advice before you visit the doctor, which is going to save you money and time as well. Samaritan Ministries is a biblical solution to health care where we can bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's affordable because they're focused on ministry and not profit. That's so a check great the, idea. Yeah, check these guys out. Join 80,000 Christian households across the nation sharing 30 million in medical needs every month. Become part of the community today at SamaritanMinistries.org slash unashamed. That's Samaritan Ministries, good Bible name, SamaritanMinistries.org slash unashamed. Join today. Exactly. So when you see that, 
don't immediately think, well, I mean, why wouldn't he wash his hands? What they were speaking of was a ritual, a ceremonial washing where you pour water. I'll, I'll give you the, from what I read, I don't have this written down, but it was basically a ceremony where you pour three times your hands in a certain manner from from the your fingers to the wrist and then from the wrist to the fingers. And it was a sign with a prayer to God that you wanted to be spiritual clean. I mean, do I have that? Yeah, and it, and it wasn't in the law of Moses. This was something that came about as a result. It's Someone called it, it build fence around the law. In other words, you have law, but then we want to take a step further. We want to build fence around that to make sure we don't mess up. And so that was this idea about cleansing. We want to make sure we're always clean before God. What was interesting is about the motivation, Jace, which is really going to play into the woes that Jesus is going to give the Pharisees when we read it, is that they weren't really concerned about hygiene either. They didn't even know anything about that. You know exactly. what? The, you know what their whole motivation was? They wanted to be seen as spiritual and godly as the priest who did have washing rituals that they were commanded to do. So, in other words, think about the minds of the Pharisee. He looks over there at the priest and he sees him going through his ritual washings that he was commanded to do by God, and he says, "Well, I don't want that guy to be look more spiritual than me." So they created their own sense of ritual cleansing. So again, it was all about what they look like. You notice when Jesus gets into these woes, it's always like you want to look a certain way. But you want to act right. like something different. So well, that, when when Jesus is doing things recorded in the Gospels, there's nothing that's accidental because it's here in God's Word. And so you see from the very beginning in verse 37, while Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. That's not a casual remark, right? The, this Pharisee was trying to trap Jesus. He was trying to set him up. That's right. And again, I don't want to, you know put motives onto Jesus, I'll let him do that himself. But it's like, you, you got to think that Jesus did not wash his hands on purpose. Exactly. So I, he could set up these points that he was going to make with the woes. Yeah, I agree. And I was just going to make the point that the reason the Sadducees didn't like the Pharisees is because of this. They're like, you're adding to the Torah. You're creating these walls, and that's why they didn't like them. And the reason I'm bringing this up, but the Sadducees, the reason they didn't like Jesus is because when he started talking about the resurrection, they're like, well, that's not in, that's not in the law either. So, so here you have these, these groups, which you know the Sadducees got wiped out by Rome for the most part, but this pharisaical spirit really survived. And you even see it in different forms in the church today. So with all that build up, I do want to read it. So like you said, verse 37, this Pharisee invites him to eat, and we, we suspect you know, he, had a, he had a trap in mind. So Jesus went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee, noticing that Jesus did not first wash before the meal, was surprised. Which is all it says if you stop right there and just say, he's surprised. In other words, hmm, I, I thought this guy was like right. s- something special. And it's not... <laughs> <laughs> the same feeling. This has nothing to do 2,000 years later when you don't see somebody wash their hands or coming out of the bathroom. And I mentioned this on a couple of podcasts. I, it's very hard for us to just stop and say, okay, they had a ceremonial ritual. They did. Don't think, you know, they weren't as uh, acclimated to hygiene as we are today. So that wasn't a part of the ritual. So, verse 39 Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisee, now, this is quite the point. Clean the outside of the cup. Now, then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. Wow, what a, what a response. <laughs> you foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But give what is inside the dish, or what you have, to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. So then he starts a series of woes, first to the Pharisees, then he kind of goes to the experts of the law. But it says, woe to you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you Pharisees, because you have the most important seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace, to your point, Al. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which men walk over without knowing it. You're like, wait, what? Now, you had a kind of a pithy explanation for that before I 
yeah in your notes about the unmarked tombs yeah yeah the idea was is that you know the the greatest speaking of contamination the greatest ceremonial contamination you could have was being near a dead body and what jesus is saying is is you're in a grave that's unmarked meaning you're contaminating people with who you are and they don't even know it right yeah. which was a powerful yeah it's like a hidden inward defilement exactly no which was see. i mean in in it, for us it's hard to realize how strong that statement is but to them that was their greatest fear what they were saying is you're a dead man walking. I mean, you're, I kinda, you're a walking I corpse. I thought it was the infamous Shaquille O'Neal quote when they were, he had had an altercation with somebody on the basketball floor. And so the media, who didn't get sometimes Shaquille O'Neal's wit, they kept bringing up the situation. You know, what do you think about this guy? And he kept saying, who? <laughs> yeah. And they would say, no, you know, when you were on the court, he's like, who? <laughs> he was saying, I, I don't know. <laughs> Who 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 is he? What has he done? Which may have been an underlying thought here, and which is interesting, and we we'll get there. But in Matthew twenty three, his description of it, he said he he went in the Matthew account. He goes way deeper, and he says you're like whitewashed tombs. In other words, on the outside you look clean, on the inside you're dead. So right. So then he gets to the experts of the law because in forty five. Now this is kind of humorous. One of the experts in the law answered him, teacher. When you say these things, you insult us also. (laughs) Jesus was kind of throwing haymakers here. The gloves come off. Jesus replied, and you experts in the law. (laughs) I love it. Let's let's take a break. I love it because it's almost like we're we're sitting over here being offended. They say, hey, whoa, ho, ho, ho. You're, you're talking about us. He said, okay, since you brought it up, let me pile, let me give that's you right. some of this. Yeah, right. And I have these I have this Pharisee uh <laughs> spirit on the brain now. When you said that when we took a break, someone at my last I did an event this past weekend. And so so then I'm out with the people, but one of them came up and he said, I got one criticism about your podcast. I know what he's I gonna thought. say. Do you do you really think you know? I think I know. What do you think? He's gonna say y'all take too many commercials. No, no, because that's, that's what I get all nope, the time. That was not it. Okay. He said you take when you take a commercial break. He said you never say welcome back. <laughs> I just I was crickets. <laughs> I was like what? <laughs> Of all the things, like he felt the need to come up to you to express that. Just say, that <laughs> yeah. means he thought about it on the drive there. And if he was I would like, have studied this, really this passage me. before, I would have said, Pharisee. <laughs> I'm telling but, you, we got to sell. But well, For so, this guy, I'm going to do something I never do. Welcome back. <laughs> so well, I asked, that was such a per- perplexing uh, criticism. So I asked him, I said, well, why does that matter? Why do you feel so strongly about that? And he's like, well, I, I don't feel strongly about it. He said, but all other podcasts, they always say, welcome back. Yeah. I said, noted. <laughs> you Pharisee. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> so verse, that just popped in my head when we took When they asked break. me, why yeah. you do so many commercials? I said, it's called capitalism. It's That's right. Yeah. It's how we no, do it. I had a different, see, I had something different. He said, we should say, welcome, welcome back. back. Welcome like back. I like Okay. okay. Jesus replied, and you experts in the law, woe to you because you load people down with burdens and can hardly, that they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your forefathers who killed them. I mean, that's, this, is getting, this is getting real here. So you, in verse uh, 48, so you testify that you approve of what your forefathers did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it. Woe to you experts in the law, because you have taken away and I really think this is important, but it says, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who are entering. When Jesus left there, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely <laughs> and to besiege him with questions, wanting, waiting to catch him 
and something you might say. So that did not go over well. I would I would classify this as a suitcase sermon. Have your bags packed because they're going to run you out of town. Well, and he started this with Jesus in verse 21 of chapter 9. The Son of Man must suffer many things and, and to be rejected by the elders, chief priests, teachers of the law, the most important people on planet Earth regarding religion. He must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. He starts his all this conversation. And as, and as he's at a point to where they said, when Jesus left there, the teachers, they began to oppose him fiercely in verse I mean, fiercely means. No, you're right, Phil. It, it, it's a valid point, which I think he is the key to knowledge that they're suppressing. Oh, I mean, so big the, time. the concept of woe, by the way, is an Old Testament one, which Jesus was around yesterday, today, and forever. You see it in Isaiah 5, Jeremiah, Amos, Micah, Habakkuk, Zechariah, Jude 11. The idea is destruction is coming. And it is interesting that one of those last ones that he talked about was the destruction of the generation, that they were going to be responsible for all this that's happened up to now. And they were. I mean, he was definitely referring to when they would suffer terribly because of their unbelief in him being the Messiah and who he was. Millions lost their life over this. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, they were wiped out. You know, you look at 80, 70 to Yeah, you see an irony here in this situation, which I don't think we think about very often, but the evil one, you know, in our contrast of good and evil, you know, Pharisees and grace, I mean, however you want to put it, the evil one can use you obviously breaking the law and rebelling, you know, through our self-indulgences and weaknesses. But you actually see here after, after seeing this, he can also use you keeping the law for the same destructions. Yep. Because you're elevating yourself instead of God, whether it's self righteousness, that, you know, when we started talking about the definition of legalism and all, you're still putting yourself first. And, and you're, you're breaking up what we started off saying. If you think there's somehow by your own efforts, you're going to gain God's approval, you've got the sequence of events backwards and are nullifying the grace of God. You know, so that, you know, in, in the short term, you, you bring up these verses for the grace of God teaches us to say no. And even in the story of Sinai and the law being given out, you know, people are, are kind of shocked that, you know, in Exodus 19, you see the image of what the gospel message brings just in that, conversation. I, I would like to read those couple of verses. Then. Well, even Phil, like to your point, it's, you start focusing on the fruit and not the reason why there is the fruit to begin with, which is the gospel. Yeah, exactly. And you miss Jesus. So let me read this. In Matthew, in uh, Exodus 19, I mean, we, this is where the Ten Commandments were given, in which I would say was the foundation and bedrock of the Pharisee mindset. When it says, then Moses went up to God and the Lord God called him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Well, if that's not deliverance and grace, I don't know what is. Now, if you obey me fully, well, you see, you had the deliverance first. Now he's given you the law and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, Listen to this. You will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So even from the beginning, you're seeing the relationship aspect of God and what he was presenting. Right. Delivered you out of my grace. Now, since you see that I love you because I love you, here are my laws. You'll understand my grace more as you follow and you, uh, you obey. You'll become holy nation, a kingdom of priests. So all these things were a shadow that Jesus would ultimately fulfill in a, and it's, in a greater way. It's very near at this time frame. This is just before Jesus. Right. Fast forward to Luke, and now we're here. Jesus yeah. came to fulfill now we're the here. law. Now so we're here. putting all the pieces. The king is here. We're going to have this relationship even greater than what we first thought. That's it. You know, so 
with that, we'll kind of indulge in how do we not have a pharisaical spirit? You gonna say something? Well, I, th- I think it's really important as we You're work just through not here. washing them hands right. <laughs> <laughs> I think part of the reason why you, you may have found it hard to, to find a lot of stuff in the section is because Jesus is not really acting real Christianly here, uh, yeah. according to a lot of modern people, to where it's just like, this is very rough language that he's using. Yeah. He's really giving these people the business. Yeah. And I will you know, talk probably a little bit later, but like some of these, some of these things, you mentioned the word haymaker. These, these are haymakers, but it, it hurt even in our modern sensibilities to read them. Like it almost hurts our feelings. But yeah. at that time there was so much attached to it because of the law, because these people didn't know who Jesus was yet, that the things that he was saying was so insane. Like that, that's why you had so many opportunities where there were these mobs that were wanting to not just trap and ensnare Jesus, but to kill him. And it was because of the words that he was saying. So when people just pretend like Jesus is this, you know, cute guy that walked around nice the Middle and East and so oh, everything's yeah. fine. And I were just going to like tell grace, like, no. yeah. without grace, law becomes a bummer. I mean, big time. <laughs> I mean, you look back, you say, well, 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 whoever kept this thing, it said, Jesus kept it. He wrote it. I love that. That's, you think you're yeah. saved by it. You better believe in me. That's a a bumper sticker. That was a bummer. Uh, Let's take a break. No, I felt so. Hey, wait, wait, wait a minute. Welcome Welcome back back to Unashamed. Welcome back. Phil, Jason, Al Robertson. Are we contributing to the Pharisaical spirit by giving in? So now you're going to get requests. Every time someone comes up to you at an event, you're going to get a request for something else that somebody wants to have changed on the podcast. Which you think you understand on our podcast because we just sometimes start talking. You come in the middle of it. Okay, welcome. What you thought was? <laughs> welcome holding back. back. So here's the here's the overarching, because we are going to break these down individually. But I want to make a point before we do that. One more is that the to me the heart of this discussion that Jesus is having it's a harsh one comes from the question of can you cleanse the conscience or the heart by cleaning the outside of a man or woman or the inside. And so I think that becomes the question. It made me think about Peter talking about the clean, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, you know, in First Peter, but but the the cleansing of your conscience before God. And when when I was studying this and preparing, it took me right back to Pontius Pilate in Matthew twenty seven twenty four. You remember he's trying to convince him not to kill him, and I, you know, let me give you an alternative. Let me give you an option. So here's what he says: When Pilate saw he was getting nowhere. But then instead an uproar was starting, which was his worst nightmare to have a rebellion because that's what he was in charge of not happening. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. And here's what he said. I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. Now they said, oh yeah, we'll take it and put it on us and our children, which is what a statement. But you know, that's a falsehood. Pilate couldn't wash his responsibility away by washing his hands. That's a great point, which I think the underlying thing here is you can do a ritual in in God's name and your heart be a million miles away, which is yeah, is is a perfect point to this. Which was Jesus's point. He wasn't against washing hands. No. But, but you gotta get past that. That's exactly right. This is here's a ritual we're gonna do. And then he looked at their lives and he's like, You're hypocritical. You're going through some ritual system. You don't care about these people. You don't care about the poor. You're giving money just because it makes you look good. You so know? think about this, Jays. I wrote this down. So the Pharisee, when he looked at a poor, unfortunate soul, that's why this is the first one Jesus went to. So he has no empathy. When he looks at this guy, when he, he doesn't say, man, I, I'm just like that person. I'm a sinner who needs grace, and, man, I'm so blessed. He doesn't think that way. He has no sympathy he doesn't think, what can I do to help this poor guy? We already talked about that. He'll walk on the other side of the road. And here's the thing. He has only apathy for this person. You know what he says? And this will come up later in Luke. He looks at that person. He says, whew, thank God I'm not that guy. That's what he's thinking when he's looking at somebody that you know is dealing with a difficult situation. And that describes the mindset. But that's more than just in the first century. You, you can bring that right on into today. You sure and can. that's the way a lot of people look at people. Well, cuz we always rank order sins. There's junior varsity sins and varsity sins, but even for Christians, it's kind of the same thing in reverse where people will allow a spirit of diminishment to be spoken over their own testimony. Because well, I'm not that guy. That guy used to be a gangbanger and a drug dealer, and now he's a Christian. And, you know, I just, I got saved at, you know, Awana or, you know, Vacation Bible School when I was seven. And they they will diminish themselves. So it's kind of the same depravity, but in reverse. Exactly. 
And we oh, say it all the time. I, I remember I've told this story before, though. I think people are so detached from that. It's like, I think I told you I played golf with a pastor one time. And, you know, he was, he, uh, you know, we're out there on a the golf course. People usually, when they meet me, they're, they, they usually think I'm less sincere of a believer than I am just because I was on Duck Dynasty. I, you know, I like to have a good time. You know, I'm frog hunting. I, I don't know why they think that, but. <laughs> Anyway, he Maybe he it's made just the this, way you look. Isn't he it? made this reference. You're looking at the outside of your dish, said, you got to look about you. He said these, you know. He said, "Man, I, he was telling me some story, and he said, "Man, I was sweating like a prostitute in church." He said, "You know what I mean?" And I was like, "I said our prostitutes don't break a sweat." <laughs> oh, what, and a look, gr- he, what a great lie! He got so choked <laughs> up because <laughs> at first he was laughing, and then he was like, "What do you mean? Are you serious, Clark?" Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cause, cause it was like beyond. I mean, he was a he's a pastor, but it was beyond him that a prostitute would be in church. But I was saying, oh, we got prostitutes we got in her. our church. You yeah. know, we got a, a few rows of them back here, and uh, I was like, they're not sweating. Cause I was thinking, they're finding relief in well, Jesus. They're, yeah, they're, they're we're actually doing this. But in that moment, you know, as the day went on, it started convicting him. Mm. I mean, it was. I really wasn't trying to convict him. I wasn't, but it were, you know, it reminds me of where we're at here in this story. I, I brought up something where it's a cliche and it's something, it's like when we get together at churches, we, we put our, our best clothes on and we, we try to look like it's a 1975 fake movie where, how are you doing? Great. Everybody's fantastic. Great. And if you could fast, I mean, uh, rewind back to all the cars coming in and just the conversations, you'd see what you should see. Or had the Mar- house before they left. Marriage oh, yeah. couples are fighting. The kid, you know, there's profanity. Kids are being, being disrespectful. Well, yeah, it's the like, life is difficult, you know. But somehow or another, that's I think at the heart of what he's trying to get at. Here. Well, even with the the whitewashed tombs and you know how it's described here, being you know. Looking clean, but not being clean. Now, earlier this year, or twice this year so far, I've had former porn stars on my show that are now ministers. So one gal named Brittany De La Mora and a guy named Joshua Broom. And these are people that were famous, rich, sought after in this super depraved, you know, profession, I guess, if you can call it that. And there are people now that are like, wait, you're, you can't be in ministry at all because of what you've, what you've done. Like, I, I know you're saved and all that, but, and it's like, wait a minute, there's nothing after the, but there is no, but actually <laughs> no, it's like, well, we wouldn't have half the new Testament if we went by that. Yeah. Right. I, you so know, that's I the thing told is, some of them the other day when I baptized them, I'm telling them this, when they come forth from the water, I said, all your sins are removed. You have God's spirit in you now. I said, don't pay any attention to signs, but just remember you could put up there, the kingdom of God meets here sometimes. And I said, that's who you tell them you are. I like that like, sign. Yeah. <laughs> See, I would endorse that sign because I hate that we have broken up into so many groups when we all that's believe, right. in, or a lot of us, that's right. most, you know, believe Jesus is the son of God. We are a part of his kingdom. You know, it's sad that most of our differences in organized religion are really small. They're almost pharisaical. Yeah, and, you know how, how many songs are we going to sing before? I like a church that sings seven songs and with a piano and a guitar, not necessarily one of the. Uh, you just think about what divides us up. Oh, it's ridiculous, and it's very small yeah. things. It's our preferences that become the point, and not the work of the gospel. So um, we're we're out of time, but before we go to overtime, uh, Kyle, tell folks about uh, Undaunted Life, how they can find your podcast. Kyle is a fantastic podcast. Tell them how they can find that. And what yeah, you do. Undaunted Life, a man's podcast is wherever you get your podcast. But Undaunted Life is here, as I mentioned in the last episode, to we're equipping men to push back darkness. And so we do that by providing content like our show that helps you forge spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. And so on our show, it is it is meant for men, but we have, you know, lady and, and kid listeners as well. But it's it's to help really steal the nerves of the men that are going to be the ones equipped to push back the darkness. And so that's what we try to do on the show. And so through guests, great through training, Bible study. By the way, great training. I love yeah. it. Doing well. My love really it. Really good. You, so uh, we always love having you on, Kyle. So we're going to go to overtime because we just really scratched into this. 
Uh, and you just brought something up, Jason, I want to talk about in the overtime, and that is the majoring in minors, because that's the first thing he's going to deal with, and that happens so much into our Christian world today, unfortunately. So we'll talk about that if you want to follow us over for our segment with Kyle, uh, blazetv.com slash unashamed for overtime. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes.